Please be seated. So we're going to talk about the uh, first two lessons this morning a bit. I saw that uh, Pastor Julie uh, preached on uh, the Mark text or the Matthew version of the Mark text, and I heard she was such a good preacher. I'm sure you remember that. So we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, a couple other lessons this morning. I think you have to hand it to the uh, Bible readers, the story writers. On the one hand, when they tell us a faith story, it can be so reverent and uh, majestic in the telling. You know, a story about God appears, and then it's all about, for a while, pillars of cloud and fire, majestic voices from mountaintops, seawater parted in two to make for dry land. It's, it's amazing stuff, these faith stories. I think this morning's story starts out like that. It starts off on the right foot. God appears, and what does Abram do? Falls flat on his face in awe and reverence, right? As he lays there, God promises him that he will be made into a mighty nation. But then there's the other hand, right? This story takes on a very human down-to-earth twist in just a few verses. When God includes Sarah, Abraham's barren wife, in that promise of a child, with the promise of generations of grandchildren to come, the Bible lesson says Abraham does another face plant. Only this one is where he falls down laughing his backside off, right? Now, I suspect with that same news, you and I might do the same if we received the promise at those ages, right? This old couple from Ur, think ur ran ur Rack, right? This old couple are old. The story says he's 100, she's 90. It would be hard not to laugh or maybe cry at, the, at that news, at that age. When Baron Sarah, standing by their tent, hears of the promise of a child, the story says she laughs too. And then she says, after I have grown old and my husband has grown old, shall I have pleasure? That ought to make us smile. It's either about the pleasure of intimacy or of finally, after all those years, bearing a child, even at their age and stage. As I read through the text this week, uh, once again, it reminded me of an old 1960s song uh, with a refrain uh, that I want to tell you in a moment here. The group was Bo Brummels. Anybody remember that? They weren't the Beatles. Okay. Uh, they're, uh, their song, one of their best songs, had this refrain. Laugh, laugh, I thought I'd cry. It seems so funny to me, right? The story says that God makes this wonderful, grace-filled promise. And Abraham laughs so hard he does a face plant and Sarah breaks out in giggles. It's like they wrote this refrain. Laugh, laugh, we thought we'd cry. It seems so funny to we, right, both of them. But here's the thing. For Jews and Muslims and Christians, all people of the book, this story and these promises made to Abraham and Sarah are still relevant today. They're essential. These two old Iraqis are our father and mother in faith, right? The covenant that God made with them, we believe, extends these thousands of years to become our covenant as well. It becomes for us, well, eventually at least, it becomes for us not just a story of giggles and face plants, but about faith planted. Faith planted by God for their sake and for our sake and for the world. This story tells not just about God's grace, but also about Abraham and Sarah's faith, their growing trust that God could do and would do for them the impossible. It says that 
they believed that God could raise the dead to life. In this story, even as good as dead genitals and gift them in the world with children when everything for them had seemed hopeless for a lifetime. I think maybe the whole point is something like this. By God's grace, this old couple came to live not on the basis of what they saw they couldn't do, but based on the promise of what they came to trust and believe that God promised to do for them and through them. Laugh, laugh, they thought they'd die laughing because it seemed so funny and impossible to them. But then they grew. They grew to trust in God's promise. They did that day by day with all the challenges to come. So the story says that when that impossible baby was finally born, they couldn't help but name him what? Laughter. Laughter. Laughter, Isaac, right? So why do we keep telling the story all these years, centuries, millennium? Well, for Abraham and Sarah and for us, it is a story of God's great grace, God's precious gift of faith, now implanted in us and grown strong through our lifetime of celebrations and sorrows, right? Isaac may have been implanted in Sarah's uterus, but faith was implanted in both their hearts and in ours. And always, the lessons say, as a gift of pure grace and deep love, right? Now come New Testament time with that message story. This story and their faith is so essential that the Apostle Paul talks about Abraham and some Sarah, but Abraham especially, talks about their faith. Oh, I lost my place. It's so essential that Apostle Paul ties Abraham and Sarah's faith to Jesus, that great, 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 great grandchild of theirs. As Abraham and Sarah trusted God, Jesus learns to trust God. As they lean into God's promises, Jesus leans into God's promises. As they became fully convinced that God was able to do what God promises to do, Jesus was also convinced in his life. They all trusted in God's saving grace. They trusted that God was able to raise the dead and to give life where death once ruled, right? Trusted, that's kind of the key word which brings the story right down to us. Again, that same trust, that same faith is being planted in you and me in our hearts through every experience, both rewarding and challenging for us. So that when everything in our own life seems to be hopeless, when change seems impossible, when life appears to be dead-ended by grace, we learn to lean into every promise that God has made, hoping against hope, as Paul says, right? Like all of God's people everywhere, for all time, we learn to live by faith. Not faith in general, but faith in what God has promised, right? A Bible commentator puts it like this. Only by the gift of faith is God's saving grace made secure. Such faith is rooted in God's powerful and trustworthy promise and life-giving grace that raises even the dead. Now in a couple of Sundays, Paul is gonna drive that home by writing letters to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 2.8, he writes a, a two-sentence assurance, a two-sentence promise that has become the foundation of our faith, especially our faith as Lutheran Christians, right? You've heard this dozens of times. For by grace you have been saved, set right through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of your effort, so that no one can boast. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good work, work which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Like Abraham and Sarah, 
We too are what God has made us, is making us. The Greek word used here is poema. It says we are God's poem. We are God's poetry in motion. But that'll bring us to another song, right? We are God's poetry. Now that ought to at least make you smile. Or if you think how we walk around, the idea that we are poetry in motion is pretty silly. But that's who we are. In these lessons this morning, what started out as a face plant in laughter or a tent giggle becomes again for us a story of faith planted in our lives, in our hearts, in the heart of the whole world, in the heart of all creation. Now, in joy and grace, we fall on our faith, our faith in hope and trust. And now the refrain that we can sing it goes like this. Laugh, laugh, we thought we'd cry because it seems so wonderful, so wonderful for everyone, including you and me. Amen. Amen. The joy in God's heart, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>